We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today again is David Hunter, or better known as Dave H. Contrarian on Twitter. He's a contrarian macro strategist with 47 years experience. He also writes a quarterly letter by subscription. David, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. So we're coming up on almost a year since you and I first spoke. Hard to believe. Um, so looking back over that time period, we've seen Biden take office, interest rates rise, the S&P and Dow make new highs, and also the dollar starting to grind lower. Has there been anything that has taken you by surprise over this over this last year? Um, well, certainly the last year itself was a surprise when it first happened. I mean, the, the pandemic and, and all that's happened um, since last March uh, has certainly been beyond anything we've seen in our lifetimes, I think. Um, so that's been surprising. In terms of the markets, not so much. Um, I was probably seen as kind of crazy when I talked about significant new highs in the market last March when the market was at 2,200 and here we are, you know, 4,200 plus. So, so um, that not so much. I would say um, the length of time it's taking gold to reemerge from its consolidation. I had a great run you know, last uh, March through early August. And I thought maybe you'd get a few month consolidation and then pick up before the end of the year. And it's certainly been a much longer consolidation. Um, I don't see it in anything other than that. Um, as I like to say, markets don't do what we always want. You know, markets have their own uh, timing. So sometimes they do things on schedule and sometimes they, they take longer. I, it doesn't cause me any concern uh, in terms of it not coming around at some point. It's just really been you know, a longer consolidation. I think part of that uh, has been the you know, last several months uh, rise in interest rates. Mm -hmm. So as I know, you say that we're headed for a spectacular melt up into the second quarter of this year. And that rally is is being led by the semiconductor and FANG stocks. So is this due in part to all the currency that's been injected into the system? For sure. It's definitely, you know, all the liquidity, both, you know, from from the uh, central banks and, and in our case, the Fed um, and and certainly the fiscal stimulus as well. That's all gone into it. Um, it's also, keep in mind, we had such a um, horrific hit last March and all through this, what's, what's kept my conviction high is all through this, this climb in the last year, uh, spectacular as it's been, um, investors have remained relatively restrained. You know, there's been skepticism all the way up. There's been a real wall of worry to climb. Um, now, you're starting to see that lift up more. You do have, you know, more signs that people are believers as the economy is recovering. Um, but there's still a healthy amount of skepticism. Every time we get a few day pullback, people come out of the woodwork saying, OK, there's a big correction coming. Yeah, not so much. There's still plenty of bears out there, but it's not so much that as people calling for bigger corrections. And I think we're going to get I think the market's been self-correcting all the way up. And every call for a bigger correction has been, you know, it's it's been far short of what they expected. So I think that's a sign that people have one leg out the door. Um, everybody's looking for a top. Um, I think at the true top, uh, you're going to have many, many more true believers saying, oh, this is, you know, a cycle. It's just getting started. So, I, you know, even though I think we're not very far away time wise, um, you know, you get a you get another 500 point five or 600 point move in the s p and psychology can be very different than it is right now so what markets will all be kind of converging and making new highs in this scenario david uh, i'm still looking for obviously the equity markets to make new highs um commodity markets to make new highs uh, i think oil is right now in the process of a correction that's not done uh, but that will come out of that correction and probably make new 
cycle highs here. I mean, new, um, you know, since last March. So you you could see seventy five dollars on the oil by this summer. Um, gold and silver certainly new highs um, and significant new highs. I think in both cases. Uh, well, not not new not new all time highs in silver, but certainly gold. Um, and and um, bonds not at all. You know, bonds I think can rally here, but um, I I think in the course of this next few months, um, you know, bonds are going to see rates backing up again after this this run um, down the road. In what uh, you know, I'm pretty well known for my global bust call. In that bust, yes, but I think bonds will make new highs there, or at least treasury bonds. <laughs> So as you were talking about the having the, let's say the psychology of having one foot out the door, David, you've been making the prediction that we're going to see an 80% correction in the stock market. Is is there a particular event that will be a catalyst for this by chance? Sure. And I would say, you know, 80 is the potential. Mm-hmm. It might be 65 or 70%, but I think the potential is there for an 80% uh, bear market, which would make it the biggest bear market in the post-World War II era. Um, and it basically comes down to a combination of the massive leverage in the system, um, the pandemic, the fragility in the system as a result of the pandemic and the leverage. Um, and, and I think we're kind of converging on a, a period of time where the Fed can get caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, they, they want to talk about transitory inflation. But everything I see in my work says inflation is going to get a lot hotter here in the next six months. And and I think the Fed's going to have a hard time ignoring it. So, you know, if they even you know, I, I like to point out that last July, we were barely a quarter or barely a few months removed from from the swoon, you know, from from a second quarter disaster. And yet they felt comfortable enough pulling several hundred billion dollars out of the, off the balance sheet. You know, they, they pulled money out of the system. Um, and I think you could see that, you know, certainly if you have, and at that time we had no inflation, and certainly if you have inflation picking up even more here, you know, they could, they could easily pull a half a billion, maybe a trillion dollars um, out of the system. I don't think people realize how fragile this system is. It, it, you know, it needs more new liquidity just to keep it going. And uh, I, I also think that fragility, that leverage, is going to surprise people in terms of the extent to which it can speed up any kind of a, you know, sell-off and make it a lot, you know, exacerbate it. I, I'd like to explore that a little bit more, David. Um, why why is it, let's say, that that this leverage is such a such a or or can can speed up this process so much? And and talk to us a little bit about how big this derivatives market really is. Yeah, I I talk about um, leverage being both debt and derivatives, and I think we talk about leverage typically in in terms of debt. So you hear people throwing around the you know the the tremendous debt that we all know is in the system. But the derivatives is, is a phenomenon that really, you know, from the late 80s on started growing. And it's so much bigger today um, than it was in the 2008 9 uh, decline. So the fact that you've got a much more, uh, you know, a, a far bigger percentage of, of the markets involved in derivatives means you know it's it's the tail wagging the door the, the dog the, the derivatives can really um speed up things and and you know obviously markets are tied to their derivatives so when things start unwinding you know it, it pushes the market so i i just think it's kind of from a simplistic standpoint um we know leverage is one of the reasons we've seen this bubble blow up and it's going to be just as much uh, responsible for why the thing can deflate very quickly. So, David, could you explain to us your view on on the inflation deflation cycle over the coming years, and and kind of give us a, a timeline and a um, let's say a five thousand foot look at how you see this this cycle with inflation and deflation developing? 
Sure. Um, it, it's important to remember that we haven't had a widespread deflationary downturn since the 1930s, since the Great Depression. So really in the entire post-World War II era, we've had you know, inflation and disinflation, but not deflation. And I think it, people throw terms around and I think they get confused. I even hear economists sometimes throw you know, they mean to say disinflation and they say deflation. You know, disinflation, as you know, is inflation um, coming at a ever lower rate. So, you know, we had inflation at 15 percent and 20 percent in the early 80s. And it's ratcheted down over the last 40 years from there to where we got down very close to zero. And now we're reversing that to some extent. Um, and I think we are so we are so late in the cycle, uh, and I do think you know the global bust is what the end of the cycle is. We are so late in this cycle that started in 2009 that uh, with inflation, you know, a year ago at close to zero, and picking up here so that it could be three to four percent, I think this year, um, but still relatively low this late in the cycle. If they have to tighten because of um, the overheating of the economy, you can easily tip into negative territory if you know if through a policy mistake and the combination of that and the pandemic after effects, um, you end up with a pretty deep downturn. Um, we're just you know we're not we're not having a downturn start with inflation at seven or eight percent. We're having a downturn start with it very low. And really a lot of the inflation is commodity inflation. So uh, that can reverse in a hurry when when demand drops. So, so that tells you that you're pretty close to a point where it's, it's, it's funny because you've got so many people worried about inflation this year, including myself and what the Fed's gonna have to do to deal with that. But at the same time, I think you're very close to on a you know longer, bigger picture, um, bigger cycles um, perspective. From longer perspective, you're very close to deflation. So having the Fed deal with what they think is a breakout in inflation on the eve of what I think is we're set up for because of leverage deflation makes a, a very complex situation for any central bank to handle. And I'm not sure they understand how fast we could slip into deflation if if um, policy mistakes are made. So, so I, I just think we're in a very unusual time where normally these things play out over um, years, and where just a, a small misstep can take you from worrying about inflation to saying, "Oh my God, we haven't been here before. You know, we haven't seen this in our lifetimes." Um, there's not any real precedent for this, uh, certainly in the last in the in the post World War II era, and as we all know, central bankers rely a lot on precedent. I mean, they you know they're they're flying blind in a lot of this. So um, so anyway, I think we could see before this year's out that downturn begin, and that downturn slip into deflation very quickly. As I say, you know, the Great Depression was a long drawn out downturn where deflation was there for several years. Um, this deflation is probably going to be contained within a, a year and the downturn is probably going to be contained within something like that. So um, I, that's why I use the term bust. It's really not a depression because it's not going to be long and drawn out, but it's going to have some of the characteristics of a depression, some of the damage of a depression in terms of the size of the the banking crisis, the size of the involuntary debt liquidation because of the massive leverage. And again, you know, we're speaking about the US, but it's really a global story. So, and I think in some some respects, Europe's in much more um, precarious position than we are financially. So, so I think this thing's gonna trip across the globe. Um, and I, I think we have the potential here We'll see, but I think we have the potential here for this to be the largest financial crisis in the history of the world. So not not the largest downturn uh, in the economy, but the largest financial crisis because of the massive leverage in the system, because the banks are, you know, there's so much 
um, risk across the spectrum. Um, and and uh, so, I, you know, I just think between the fourth quarter of this year and the middle of next year could be, you know, maybe the roughest, roughest time in my, I've been in this 48 years and maybe the roughest period we've seen. Mm -hmm. So, David, is it possible that we can kind of parse this out? Um, you're saying that we're we're going to see inflation and deflation, but if we look at different sectors of the economy, could we see um, deflation and inflation happening happening simultaneously? I don't think so. Anything's possible, and because it's going to be very quick, and certainly they're going to come back the other way with all kinds of liquidity. It's hard to know whether you know everything's going to deflate. I, it's it's going to be not like the deflation of the 30s where you know it just played out year after year so that everything just kept getting more gloomy this will be fast enough it's possible i would say you know for example you may be thinking of real estate you know we have no inventory in real estate and it'd be easy to make the case that yeah you could have real estate soften a little bit but you're not going to get any big uh, decline in real estate because this isn't going to be down long enough or because they're going to be pumping liquidity up fast, you know, uh, soon enough. That's possible, but more likely um, this thing unwinds so dramatically. I just tell people go back and look at last March and how fast we went into the sw second quarter swoon. I mean, it, it was scary. I mean, we didn't know where we were. And I realized it was forced shut down so that was part of it but but that should tell people both from a market perspective and an economic perspective that things can can go from seemingly pretty good to very bad in a hurry because of that leverage because of this uh the way the system is set up um so my, my at least my my primary forecast would say most things are going to deflate um, you know, most assets anyway, certainly. Um, but, you know, is it going to be long and drawn out? No, because, and the other thing is, don't forget, there's a lag to um, when the money is created to when it, you know, turns things again. So even if they were quick to turn the spigots back on, um, you're still talking, you know, probably nine months before it really impacts the economy and maybe another year and a half before it impacts, you know, inflation in a big way. So, so I, I do think, you know, I think there's a tendency out there, um, particularly in the retail public, to think in these linear terms where everything happens, bing, bang, boom. And so, yeah, well, how, how can you have a bear market if the Fed knows they have to print money? How, how you know, since they've already learned this lesson, how are you going to have a bear market? And I don't think people realize, you know, pauses in this kind of a leverage situation can be eternities. You know, if you have if you have a few months where they're they're not sure what to do because they're facing inflation, that few months of misstep can feel like an eternity. So if if the Fed starts to to really try and combat this inflation. Are, are we going to see some type of yield curve control and, and that ultimately leads to the to the bust? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not in the camp where I, I will say for sure, yield curve control on a longer term basis is a myth. There's no such thing because it because inflation is going to force their hand mm -hmm. in the short run. Sure, they can try. I don't think Yield control controls are the issue because rates are going to be dropping because of the the um, bust, and then the, on coming out the other way, rates aren't going to be the issue. You know, it, it, you're you're probably a, you know, let's say the bust starts late this year and carries through at least first half of next year, maybe all next year. Um, you're probably looking at 2024 before you really have another inflation concern like we have right now, you know, where, where you're pushing above 4% and people are starting to say, hey, this thing's getting going. It's going to take a while coming out of deflation to just get back above zero, um, at least several months and maybe a year. 
Uh, and then you're going to be in very low single digits for a little while because you're, you know, uh, I think we can use last year as a microcosm or, or some kind of a, you know, uh, can get some understanding of what it will look like on the other side of the bust. And so, you know, the real inflation story, I think, is out in 20, you know, mid-decade, twenty beginning in 2024, but really 2025, six is when I think you're starting to push high single digits into double digit inflation. And that's when, you know, you can talk about yield, co- uh, yield curve controls at that time. Having lived through the Volcker era, you know, and the G. William Miller era prior to that that got us there, you know, thinking you can control interest rates the only way you control interest rates is by pouring more fuel on the fire. By pouring more fuel on the fire, you're going to have even a bigger inflation problem. That's exactly what got us in trouble was G. William Miller thought he was tightening because rates were going up gradually. and But he was having to pour money in to keep the rates from going up faster. You know, he was trying to manipulate the market. And I'm not sure he saw it that way, but, but that led to inflation getting more fuel and, you know, it's a monetary event, ultimately, and you get an overheated situation. And once you get above a certain lift oil point, it really becomes very, very difficult to control the inflation. It takes a real much bigger tightening. You were mentioning the basically the speed at which uh, the interest rates are going up. So why does this matter so much to the Fed? Um, well, interest rates obviously impact economic activity, uh, particularly in housing, um, and so um, and and auto purchase, et cetera. Some some big parts of our economy are very much um, interest rate sensitive, more so today than ever. I mean, these low rates, you you move them a percent, and it can shut down refinancing. It can shut down. Um, home buying, et cetera. So people are really dependent on very low rates. So they they do worry about that. I have to say, I'm much more of a, a monetarist where I think money is what matters most and that the price of money will ultimately follow, you know, the market will determine that. But in the, in the shorter run, um, you know, certainly the Fed feels the control over the economy is really, um, you know, rate control. So in that vein, David, where do you see the dollar going from here? Is it going to continue to 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 kind of grind lower at this at this pace, or or how do you see this dollar scenario yeah, I, developing? I think last time we talked, I had an eighty-five target on the dollar, um, got down to I think eighty-nine, and then it's you know spent most of this year uh, going back from there back to you know ninety ninety-three or almost ninety-four. Um, I think we've rolled over again. Um, I've actually lowered my target, which had been 85 for quite some time. Uh, I think there's a, you know, 85 is a minimum, but I think there's a pretty good chance we could go down to 82. Um, and so I think we've started that move back down. I know there's still a lot of people out there talking stronger dollar and thinking that, you know, it can it can get up into the mid 90s. I don't think so. I think we've broken back down, or you know, we've finished the consolidation, the upward consolidation. Um, so, uh, and part of the, part of my um, call is based on what I see in the other currencies. Um, you know, the euro looks like against the dollar looks like we can get up to a dollar third, uh, up to one thirty. Um, I think a Canadian dollar. I've raised my target. I had an eighty, you know. 0.85 target, it looks like it can get up to 0.90. Uh, the Aussie dollar can get up to maybe 0.85 and maybe even higher than that. So so I'm looking at you know other moves and other currencies, and it tells me the dollar is going to be weaker than I even expected. So that will help fuel the inflation, help fuel the commodity run here. And I think that move is between now and Labor Day. I mean, and maybe sooner. You know, it's it's starting now. And it's not going to be slow. It's not going to be, you know, there'll be days where you get the counter moves and or, or flatness. But but ultimately, I think the move from here down to 85 and maybe 82 happens in a matter of months. So as I as I know that timelines are, are really hard to pin down, David, do you still kind of have that that's end of second quarter timeline for this for this bus to start? 
Well, not the bust. I have said for quite some time, uh, certainly coming into this year, that the bust is a second half event, probably a latter part of the year event. So, you know, I don't I don't expect the bust certainly to start in second quarter. And I have to um, kind of make clear the bear market is refers to the market, obviously, to the equity market. The bust refers to the economy. The stock market typically leads the economy by several months. So if we get a top in the stock market this quarter, and I'm still saying I think that's likely, um, a top doesn't mean you know you hit a top and then you're on your way down the next day. So that top could could reverse quickly. Oftentimes, though, as you will know, it it reverses um, and then has a secondary rally back up and retest that high. Uh, maybe it doesn't go all the way back up. So you could be, you know, midway through the third quarter where you really, before you really start seeing the market unwind or it could unwind quickly. I, I have no way of knowing. But, you know, if the window of the top is, let's say, um, end of May to, um, you know, early July, and and that top then stretches out into, you know, much of the third quarter, you know, your bus may not start until late this year. Um, if the top is is May and we reverse pretty quickly, you know, bust is probably more likely a, a late third quarter or early fourth quarter event. So, you know, I, I still think the bus starts this year, but I don't know whether it's, you know, starts in September or December, you know, type of thing. Um, and that's that's the economy. We'll feel like we're there because the bear market will be, you know, on its way before that. So, so I'm I'm really just talking about what what you know what will the economic um, statistics show was the actual peak in the economy, and it might be, you know, might be third quarter. So as as the let's say the market correction um, proceeds, what happens to the metals and miners in that scenario, David? Yeah, my guess is that they they. Definitely correct, as with most assets um, in in the uh, bear market or in the in the bust, um, but probably far less than the equity markets do. Um, partly because I think the Fed will be coming back in um, with both feet, you know, meaning easing aggressively, uh, you know, once they start seeing this thing unwind pretty pretty fast. So, so I think the timing on gold and silver going back the other way back up will come before the stock market, because I think people will be more attuned to, hey, when the Fed's really aggressively easing, we want to get into those precious metals. But I, I'm guessing probably you could have a, a 30% pullback in the metals, maybe a little more in silver. Um, so if you know my forecast on, on gold is 2,500 for you know, the next several months, um, probably a third quarter top. Um, and if if you get a 30% move from there, you know, you're basically back here. Um, silver, you know, I think you can get to 45.50. Let's say it's a 40% move back or 30, you know, 35, 40% move back. Um, you're, you're talking about something back here, <laughs> you know, so... So it's not like there's a lot of downside from here. I know there's still a lot of people that are talking lower numbers on on both gold and silver, but uh, I tend to think we're, you know, you may come back and retest this during the bus, but I don't think you're going a lot lower than these levels. Now, you know, a couple of years ago, I was in the camp that said, you know, gold gold could see, you know, 500 or 800 in in the bust, but I'm I'm not there anymore. I just don't think it's possible it could get down towards a thousand, but I doubt it. I, I think it's probably, I think this time spent, this last many, many months spent in that um, 17, 1800 area may serve as the floor. So typically we hear that real rates are closely related to the gold price. So why have they uh, become disconnected over the past couple months? Yeah, it's funny because I think. People, you know, we use the CPI or a lot of people use CPI um, as a measure of inflation when they're talking about real rates and they, they've been talking about real rates rising. But in fact, if you if you were more, um, you know, just looking at what inflation's done in this 
you know, first part of this year, there's no doubt when you look at, certainly when you look at a lot of the, you know, across the board com commodity complex or, you know, in uh, costs in other areas, you know, auto costs, housing costs, et cetera, it's very hard to argue that CPI is an accurate measure of inflation right now, right? I mean, we are, you know, for years people have said, the government's manipulating that number, but I'm not necessarily in that camp as much as just saying, you know, if you really want realistic inflation, you can't be looking and saying it's one and a half or two percent. It's it's certainly in the last many months has has gone much higher than that. So I think, you know, whether it's the algos or whoever's judging real rates, I think they're using an artificial um, number as your as your denominator to argue that it, you know real rates are rising along with nominal rates i think nominal rates obviously have risen and i was probably the first one out there to when when uh, the tenure was 0.6 i was talking about it going to one 120 to 140 and then it raised to 150 um and so um the rate rise didn't surprise me but the call that the real rates are still rising I think it's just false. I think real rates, but but that's what the market believed, or that's what the algo believed. So I think they they did that. Now I, you know, going forward, I don't see how anybody can believe real rates are rising um, unless unless nominal go up a lot. Um, and I think so. Even though I'm calling for a 120 10 year um, this quarter in the next month or two, um, and so if the nominal goes to 120. Clearly, real rates are dropping and dropping fairly fast. And then I'm calling for a, a two and a half, 10 year um, as the Fed begins to tighten and as inflation begins to take off. Um, but even there, I think inflation is going to be outpacing that rise from 120 to two and a half. So it's hard to it's hard for me to see a scenario between now and Labor Day where you make the case that real rates are rising. I think they'll be they'll be falling even if nominal rates are going up. David, as, as we take a step back to look at the financial landscape at this time, what in your view are some of the biggest bubbles that will suffer in this in this bust as you have coined it? Are, are we gonna see, let's say house prices really really come down? Uh, crypto, where do you see these, the let's say the biggest declines um, or, or the biggest bubbles that are going to pop? Yeah, I would say certainly the equity market. I mean, I think it's been a, a remarkable run, as I've said for a long time. I believe we're we're coming on a um, secular peak that started back in 1982, and I could even make the case started in 1974. So it's been an amazing run, but there are so many signs that we're in that. And I started talking about this several years ago. We're in that final parabolic stage. So not not many markets are in parabolics like like equities are. And parabolic just tells you, I think you're in a very speculative stage. That's the end, the end stage of a long-term market. That tells me that equities are the, you know, probably the prime area, prime asset uh, that's going to get hit hard. Um, junk bonds also, um, and um, you know, to a lesser extent, certainly some of these other assets like. Um, you know, real estate. Real estate's a funny one because I do think we may be making a secular top here. Um, and in fact, probably likely are. Um, but I just don't know how how fast and how hard things are going to fall. Um, you know, I think in in the States anyway, you know, we got hit so hard in 2008, nine. Is this going to be a lot like that one? We don't have the subprime issues this time, but we have other issues. Um, Canada and, and Australia are some of the, you know, those kind of markets, I think they're where we were in 2008-9. So, yeah, I think those are going to be huge bubbles that break big. Um, but, and and I, think, I think the U.S. housing is going to get hit hard. I just don't know if it's going to be 2008-9 hard. I just, I, I doubt that. So as you, as you use the, the term super cycle, David, does this apply to your view on commodities in general for the coming years? Um, for sure, you know, we're in, you know, we're in a super cycle and I define a super cycle as between two depressions. So if the 1930s was your last depression, 
I believe the 2030s are likely to be the next depression. Um, so that's why I say this is a bust, not a depression. So we still have one more recovery cycle after this bust to get us to the, what I would think will be the end of the super cycle. Um, and so by the end of the super cycle, for sure, commodities I think are, are in for a huge run um, in the post bust era. Um, it's not a straight line as I like to caution people, you know, the, the move in commodities this year has been a great run. And you got a lot of analysts out there calling for a super cycle in commodities from here. That bust is going to interrupt the commodity cycle. Um, and so just be careful as I use the analogy. You know, it's like standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, looking across the north rim and thinking it's a straight line across when there's this huge canyon in between. So, you know, thinking you can buy commodities today and that there'll be no um, the, you know, just own them right on through. You've got that bus is going to be a big canyon for commodities. Um, and so, but starting in say 20, um, you know, latter part of 2022 through the end of the decade, commodities are going to have a run like they've never had in history. You know, oil can get to $300 plus, you know, gold can get to $10,000 plus, silver can get to $300 plus. And I think those pluses may make my numbers look silly, you know, silly low when we get there. So I think it's, you know, I just can't see anything beyond those numbers to give a number. But but I think commodities are going to have unbelievable runs. Copper, you know, copper could go up tenfold or, or you know, seven or eightfold, you know. Um, so there's, uh, I think there's big moves coming in the next cycle because of the massive money that the whole, you know, the whole world's going to be putting out there to, deal with the financial crisis. Um, but yes, it's a super cycle. Like I said, equities, in my opinion, again, talking about US equities, but probably to a great extent, other places too. Um, you know, you're, you're going to make a uh, secular top here, meaning that the recovery cycle in equities after the bust, you won't come close to these highs. The highs we see, whether it's this quarter or next, I doubt that we come close to those. So if it's 4,700 on the S&P, or maybe it's 5,000 when you get in a parabolic, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not pretending to know exactly where it stops, but it's, it, we're in the area, somewhere 4,700 to 5,000, probably a pretty good guess about the top. Next cycle, you could, if you have an 80% drop and you get back to 1,000, you could, you could triple the S&P out of that bottom or, or even quadruple it and you're still falling far short of the top. So it's not to say that equities won't have a run next cycle, but I think you're you're making a, a secular top that's probably going to stand for decades. And I don't know whether that's two decades or many more decades than that, but decades. Um, whereas gold and silver and other commodities next cycle they go on to much, much, much higher highs. Um, so it's, you know, there'll be a great opportunity following the bust. It's just not going to be in the same areas, um, not the same assets, not the same uh, sectors of the stock market. Um, you know, social media stocks and the fangs and, and um, you know, growth stocks in general, they're going to be dealing with a tremendous headwind of inflation, meaning inflation and high interest rates as rates move from, let's say, I'll just use a 10 year from zero at the top of the bond market in the bust. Um, you could see the 10 year back to 15% by the end of the decade. How, how do you, how, how, uh, and buying index funds, how, how do you think that rise from zero to 15 in rates is gonna impact PE multiples? It's an inverse relationship. It's going to impact them pretty negatively. So, so it's going to be very hard for indexes to do well next cycle overall. But that doesn't rule out the sectors that really benefit from inflation. So as a macro voice, David, you, you actually speak quite a bit about oil. And I wanted to ask, how important is the oil price in today's economy? And, and do you use it as a, as a particular tool, uh, let's say, in your, in your toolkit to, to analyze other markets as well? I, I look at it certainly. I don't. It's not a primary driver. I mean, because we've had 
um, you know, oil and gas prices under control here. So it's been a benefit to consumers in general. Obviously, of late, gas prices have moved up and, you know, oil's moving up but or had moved up. But um, but really, I, I think longer term, um, it's, it's a big factor in the next cycle. I mean, that's why I think the next cycle is going to be an industrially led cycle. The consumer is going to be, on the one hand, digging out from a, a horrendous bust that's, you know, they're, they're not strong going into it. Um, you know, financially, we've had decades of, you know, people really struggling. And we all know the story about the haves and the have nots. There's a big part of the uh, world economy that's a have not. And so they're going to be struggling. And then you add on to that, you know, if oil prices go to $300 plus a barrel, you know, what's that do to gasoline price? They're going to be easily double digit. What's that do to, you know, uh, heating oil prices, et cetera. So I think the consumer is going to have, you know, a real problem, even if wages finally begin to break out they're not going to be able to keep pace. They're going to be following inflation, not leading it by any means, especially in the kind of fast uh, commodity cycle we're going to see. So, yeah, I mean, oil is in, in a bigger picture way, something I look at all the time in terms of how is that going to impact my longer forecast. In terms of, you know, my my last year's forecast, it wasn't a big, big driver. We've spoken about, you know, looking at something like a like a banking crisis going into this, David, and I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, there's there's a lot of analysts out there talking about currency resets and and new digital currencies or or, or a world currency. How do you how do you see that um, developing? Um, yeah, I'm not big on the reset. I think if we're going to have a reset, I think it's late in the decade. Um, yeah, I don't believe we're, you know, I know there's concerns about um, what China's doing with uh, crypto, et cetera, now. Um, I, I, you know, I, I just don't see anything poised to be able to take over the dollar's role as a reserve currency in the next five years. You go out beyond that, and it's anybody's guess. Um, I do I do think the dollar's going to be in trouble within that five-year time horizon. You know, I have... We talked about my view that the dollar is going to the low 80s here. Uh, I also think the dollar is going to be 120 plus uh, in the bust. That It will be the currency everybody runs to during the bust because they don't know where else to run um, and don't have anywhere else to run. Um, But then starting from that, wherever that high is, over 120, um, I think the dollar begins a long-term erosion through then to the end of the decade where it could be, you know, less than 50 cents. I mean, it could be a lot, you know, a lot lower than 80. Um, and so the dollar is not, you know, I'm not a bull on the dollar beyond the bust or, you know, that period. Um, but it's not going to be replaced as a reserve currency, I don't think, until you get later in, you know, much later in the decade. My, my do, I do believe that, you know, you talk about high inflation, you know, 15, 20% inflation rates, interest rates at 15%, uh, and short rates probably, you know, like they were in the early 80s, up around 20%. Um, you know, those are all things that argue that, you know, the bust is going to seem not the, to be the big deal once, because that takes the, all the central banks out of the game. If you don't have, you know, that's why I've been such a bull. Um, even last March, uh, I said, you know, the Fed's not out of bullets. They're not even close to out of bullets because in deflation or low inflation, they have unlimited ability to print. Um, you get to the opposite situation where you have interest rates, you know, high and inflation high. As I said before, they can't pour fuel on the fire because it just exacerbates what they're trying to fix. Um, so that takes them out of the game. The Treasury will be long out of the game because nobody's going to want to buy Treasury paper uh, well, we can't service that debt. Um, so you get to the end of the decade, and basically, there's nothing to prop up things when they roll over. You know, there's there's no way the Fed can intervene, and so that's when you can get the collapse of the system. You know, what I call the, you know, the collapse of the Ponzi scheme that's built up over you know five decades, um, and not you know I speak of the U.S. mostly, but it's really a worldwide event. 
And what comes out of a collapse of the last 50 years is anybody's guess, but I don't think it's something that anybody should look forward to because it more likely is a totalitarian response. You know, it's more likely to be something. So I just, people don't want to talk about resets and stuff. That's your reset. And that's nothing you can predict or, or plan for. You know, it's just going to come. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, you, you can design any currency you want. If you get that kind of a collapse, it doesn't matter. I'd like to turn a little bit to talking about investor psychology with you, David. Why is it so hard for most investors to buy at bottoms? And, and why is it hard as well for, for some of them to take profits at these euphoric tops that we're going to see? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's yeah, you know, I've spent 48 years as a contrarian studying that stuff, and I don't have any scientific answer for you. What I do have is I can tell you from being one of those that fought the crowd that the vast majority of people just are not comfortable being outside the crowd. You know, I, I, there's a lot of people today. You know, when I was a contrarian back in the early 70s. You know, it was a rare event. There weren't very many, and it wasn't something you trumpeted. It wasn't, you know, today everybody wants to tell you they're a contrarian because there have been books out there talking about, you know, how it's it's wise to be opposite to what the crowd is, et cetera. But we can go back in history to the tulip bulb craze to, you know, all kinds of various times, and there have been books written on it, you know, the madness of crowds. It is just a psychological truth that the vast majority of people, whether they know it or not, are not comfortable being outside the crowd and are influenced by the crowd. You know, they they can say, I'm a contrarian, but in the end, when push comes to shove, um, it's a very small percentage of people who feel comfortable with conviction being against that crowd. Most of the time, you know, they can do it in, in uh, verbiage, but if you look at what their actions are, they're you know, they're hedged every which way because they're not comfortable. So, so it's just a, um, you know, the crowd is, is going to be most excited at tops and least excited at bottoms. And so they're, and, and, you know, interestingly, and this probably only made it worse is with, with the advent of computers and everybody being a technician today, and everybody being a relative strength technician, um, it it just follows that they go with the momentum, you know? So as you recently tweeted, perspective is important in investing, but often lacking among investors. The perception that the miners behave terribly, or, or the perception is that the miners behave terribly. Sentiment is very negative. So how do you look at this, David, and, and why is it, or how does it inform your decisions here? Yeah, I guess probably the way I'd answer that is, uh, to me, a lot of times people become too myopic. And and so that's what I mean by perspective is sometimes you have to step back, broaden out the chart, broaden out the time horizon. Um, and, you know, for example, I mean, gold and silver are a great example. You know, um, everybody loved it back in early August. And, you know, where people who didn't like it a few months earlier, we're starting to really talk bullish. And like I said, even I thought, okay, I'll have a few months rest because it's gone too far. Um, but, you know, when it didn't happen after a few months, people lose more and more faith because they say, well, I thought, you know, I thought it would have turned by now. And they lose all perspective if you step back. And, and intro, here's a good example. Um, gold, um, this happened to me on Twitter. Gold about the um, fourth week of March, the one year anniversary was passed of the swoon of the, you know, the big uh, pandemic break. So I had people coming to me and saying, you know, gold's, gold hasn't, hasn't gained anything in the last year. Yeah, but if you step back another week to the bottom, you know, gold, Gold had gone down to fourteen sixty, and when they were saying that, gold was you know seventeen hundred or sixteen eighty. So, you know, perspective is that one year versus one year and one week gave you two different pictures, and they lose that perspective because they're only caught on the one year chart. You know, so it's really important, I think, sometimes to kind of step back and see where you are. 
I, uh, you know, I've, I've caught a lot of grief uh, in recent months because I go, I love the gold chart. I love the silver chart. You know, they, they are in flag formation. When they break out, they're going to break out vertically and they're going to go a long ways. And yet, people only see the fact that, gee, gold was 2100 and now it's 1700, you know, back, back a few weeks ago. And, and, you know, it's lost a lot of money for me while everything else is going up. So, you know, again, timing, timing is part of the story, but perspective and, and having a little bit broader uh, perspective can, can make a big difference. Are there any tools or processes that you use to guide your decision making on when to take profits in an investment, David? Not really. It's really, um, you know, I don't want to say it's feel. Uh, obviously, if I see uh, it's, I'd say sentiment drives me more than anything. Um, you know, if I see sentiment really to an extreme in either direction, that has probably as big an impact on me as anything else. Um, but, you know, fundamentals matter to me. Macro matters to me. I just, it's really putting the whole thing into a, you know, a mixer and saying, how does it shake out? Excellent. So David, as, as we kind of wrap up here, um, can you give us some of your price targets, uh, let's say towards the end of the second quarter here, um, before we really have to put our seatbelts on? Sure. Yeah. I'll start with the stock market. And I, I do think S&P, my current target, I've raised it uh, in the last month, but my current target's 4,700. And like I said, and I've said this several times on Twitter, uh, I won't be surprised if my numbers are too conservative. So, well, people think I'm insane with these numbers. I think I'm probably going to be low. So S&P 4,700, um, Dow 38,000, uh, NASDAQ 17,000. Um, and uh, then on, on um, the bonds, um, I think you can, like I said, you can get to an interest rate, you can get to a 120 here this quarter uh, and then start pushing back up to two and a half. The 30 year, I think, can get down to say 195 and then start pushing back to 3%. Um, gold 2,500 is my top, um, you know, and again, I might push beyond that, but that's kind of my target. Um, silver 45 to 50, um, longer term beyond that, you know, as I said, those things have a lot of upside, but it's just not going to be a straight line. Um, oil probably can get down to the low fifties here. The jury's out right now, but I, I'm, my best guess, I mean, it's possible we've had our consolidation oil and it starts running again, but I think more likely um, it gets down to somewhere between 50 and 54 before it makes another run at 75. Um, and then in the bust, I expect oil down to, you know, below $20, maybe $10 again um, before it starts the big, you know, the big move coming out of the bust. Um, let's see, what have I missed? Um, GDX, GDXG? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and the miners themselves, GDX, um, I've raised my target. I've been saying 55. I think 60 uh, is a better target. Um, GDXJ, my target's 100. Um, uh, SIL, which is a silver ETF, um, probably 75. And SILJ, I've been using, I have been using 30, and I think 35, and I think that's probably going to prove low. If, if silver goes to 45 or 50, I wouldn't be surprised to see if these numbers get exceeded. So um, we'll see, but I, I think it's, we're very close. I think, you know, you're starting to see the downtrend being broken, the, the recent downtrend, and, and I, I do think the gold and silver are going to start acting better as we move through this quarter. Excellent, David. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Um, let's see. What haven't we touched on? You know, obviously, uh, from a, a longer term standpoint, you know, the junk bond area is an area that's very frothy. You know, people, because of these low yields we've had, have really reached out on the risk curve to get income. And I would just caution people that um, you know, not, equities are probably number one, but I think junk bonds are right behind them in terms of the two areas that are going to get the, hit the hardest in terms of uh, the bust. You know, they are they are you know the exact example of what leverage means. 
And and if if I'm right about oil, you know, if we get oil back from 75 down to 10, you know, as you well know, there's a lot of leverage in in the shale oil area that kind of got bailed out in March, you know, in the second quarter of last year that I think is going to um, have real problems, you know, in the bust and, and won't be bailed out. Excellent, David. And as always, we can get more of your uh, your updates and and um, you provide great analysis on your on your Twitter at Dave H. Contrarian. And also tell us about your uh, quarterly newsletter that you put out. Yeah, I write a, a, a quarterly letter that um, if people are interested, it's basically my macro in a, a bit broader perspective on Twitter. Obviously, you're limited by what you can put out there. So um, if people want more on my forecasts, um, they go out quarterly and people wonder why I don't write more often. I said, you know, I'm a big, big picture guy. You know, I think one of the things I push back on is trying to get people to be not not so trader oriented and be, like I said, that broader perspective, bigger picture perspective. So I purposely don't put things out uh, more than quarterly. So a quarterly letter, uh, if people have any interest in that, they can inquire uh, by DM, you know, just direct message me on Twitter. Um, and again, my handle there is at Dave H. Contrarian. Excellent, David. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I think we're going to have some fun this this quarter. Absolutely. It'll be, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Okay, thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.